Welcome back to the Working at Woodworking podcast. My name is Roger Kugler. I've been a woodworker for over 50 years and a professional for the last 20. I'm here to help you start your career or side hustle solving people's problems, whether that be a broken table leg, a damaged end table, or maybe a whole new dining room set. There's a great need for people working in the trades, and I'm here to help you maybe nudge you a little bit, provide information for you to contribute to the cause. So by now you should have a pretty good idea of what you want to make or what services you want to provide. Probably it's going to be a little combination of both. So today let's talk about where you're going to do this. Your shop. So since this is a solo operation, a one person operation, you don't need that much space. We're not talking about two, three, four thousand square feet. If you can carve out 300, 400 square feet someplace, you're probably in pretty good stead. The two car garage, that is probably the most popular shop space for most people. You might have a basement shop or lucky enough to have a detached building that you can turn into a shop. Let's talk about the garage first. One car garage, two car garage, one and a half car garage. Maybe you're fortunate to have a four car garage. You might even be able to keep a vehicle in there. And that's probably one of the first things we have to get over. If you're the type who is used to having a car in the garage and maybe your better half likes having a car in the garage, that's going to be the first hurdle. Sure, if you just do woodworking on the weekend, you can roll everything you know, to the side or to the front and bring a car in during the week. But to do this full time, that's I don't think that's going to work very well. You're going to have stuff that's just unmovable. You're going to need more space. The deal I made with my wife when we decided to go down this path was the car stays in the driveway and I am on permanent ice scraping duty. She never goes to work without me first scraping her windows. And from what I've heard from other woodworkers who have a dedicated workshop in their garage, this is the deal they made also. So it's doable. The next thing you need to consider is any covenants in your neighborhood. Maybe you're in a planned unit development. There's a, a homeowners association and they have rules and regulations. They may not allow you to have a full-time woodworking business in your garage. So you got to check on that. If you do, it's really unfortunate. Maybe look for another, you know, sideline uh, gig. But that's going to be pretty insurmountable short of moving, which might not be a bad idea. Also consider your neighbors. If you have a difficult neighbor right next door that you've had problems with in the past, running a woodworking shop full-time may not improve that relationship. So consider your neighbors. They say that fences make the best neighbors. You might need to build a little higher fence. Of course, if the city would allow you to do such a thing. And you need to check with the city because a lot of times they'll have ordinance that would prohibit such type of work. Or at the very least, they would require you to go around the neighborhood to find out if any neighbors would object to you doing this type of work. So it really depends what part of the country you you live in, urban, rural, what type of city it is or town. 
you're going to have to do some legwork on this. Find this stuff out before you hang out the shingle. So what about a basement workshop? Yeah, you can probably fly under the radar for a lot of things in a basement workshop. I know a lot of people who are retired who produce a lot of furniture in their basement workshop. I grew up in a basement workshop. Just a couple caveats, points of recommendation I might give is you're going to produce uh, noise and dust. And depending on your HVAC system, your, your heating and air system, that noise and dust can be transported into the rest of the house. If you have a forced air uh, he, uh, heating system, that can get into the ductwork and go from the basement up into the bedrooms or into the kitchen and spread throughout the house. That means you're going to be dusting more, you're going to be cleaning more, and most certainly changing the furnace filters a lot more. Sound. If someone directly above you is trying to watch their favorite TV show or Netflix program and you're down there using a router, that might not work out real well. So consider various types of soundproofing materials that can be installed to kind of cut down on that and allow people to coexist a little more peacefully. And I think the last thing to, to mention from my own personal experience is humidity. We had a wet basement. If we got a real good hard rain, the basement flooded. And so all the tools were, were up on blocks and it's just something we learned to, to live with. And that included rusty tools. So you had to do a, we had to do a lot of work to, uh, uh, to combat that. You might want to consider a dehumidifier to help control some of that moisture. And that could also affect your wood storage. So things to consider. In fact, access is something that you're definitely going to have to consider. How are you going to get a sheet of 4x8 plywood into your basement shop? Maybe you have a walkout sliding door. That would be ideal. Maybe French doors that, that open you know, for a 72-inch clearance. That would be super Otherwise, you're probably breaking down that plywood out in the driveway and then bringing it in. And most importantly, if you build something, can you get it out of the basement? Just saying, things to think about, you know, before you, you dive in. What about a detached building? I think this is probably the ideal. Maybe you have a two-car, three-car detached garage, outstanding. Maybe there's a barn or a shed that you could convert. And it looks like I may have a customer. So I'm going to pause and we'll be right back. Something I didn't mention last week when we talked about what to make, what to do, consider just milling things for people. This is a gentleman who stopped by yesterday and asked me to cut some flooring for him to, to length. And it didn't take very long. He was most appreciative. And he just stopped back in. He needed, um, you know, about a sixteenth taken off a, a few pieces. So I had another lady uh, come in today who is replacing part of a, a stair banister. Uh, rail and she needs a uh, a round over cut on one edge of a maple board and a uh, bevel cut on the other end of the uh, maple board. So just little things they take fifteen minutes, thirty minutes, not very long, and it's a service you could provide because these folks they might have the skills to do things, but they don't have the the chop saw, the table saw, to accomplish them. And 
they are more than happy to uh, you know throw a few few dollars your way for a little bit of your your uh, time. So anyway, we were talking about detached garages or a barn, a shed. Um, this is probably going to be your more expensive option, but probably one of the better options. For one thing, I think it's very professional to have a separate building for your business. You can work out of the, you know, attached two-car garage. Works fine for a lot of people. But there are comments, oh, I didn't realize that you worked out of your garage, which is another way of saying, you must be too poor to be able to afford your own building. Well, yeah, probably guilty on both counts. But um, I think there's a lot of advantages to that detached workshop. One thing that happens when you work from home is you're not always working. You come into the house to get a glass of milk or to make some tea and, oh yeah, I never put that laundry in that I was supposed to. So you go and you do the laundry and you come back in and it's like, ah, geez, the kids never loaded the dishwasher. And so you load the dishwasher. And before you know it, 30 minutes, 45 minutes have gone by and you've done nothing out in the shop. It happens. Some people say it doesn't. I think they're not telling the truth. There is a time suck with working from home. If you are in another building, I think you cut down on that a lot, especially if you have outfitted it to the point where you don't need to go to the house to go to the bathroom to make a cup of tea. That is your workspace. And I think in the long run, that's going to work out much better for you uh, as opposed to something in your home, whether a, a garage or a basement or something like that. Just saying, um, I don't have that. Wish I did. If you are in a position that that could be an option for you, I would strongly encourage you to uh, uh, weigh that heavily. There's a a guy in Ohio who started his work, woodworking business in a chicken coop. So you don't need things big and elaborate. He literally started in an old chicken coop. And I to hear him tell the story... It was a lot of work cleaning out the chicken coop. But today, some, wow, 50 years later, that chicken coop has turned into uh, several large buildings with over 300 employees and more CNC machines than I could count. Uh, the gentleman's name is P. Graham Dunn. If you want to do a Google search on that. Incredibly interesting story. Everything from war-torn China to a silk wedding dress and even the Doolittle Raid over Japan in World War II. There's a love story and courtship involved, and it led to a chicken coop and then to 300-plus employees. Very, very interesting story. What about a rented space? It kind of depends on your location. In some places of the country, that could be very economical. And other parts of the country, that could be quite expensive. Speaking about parts of the country, sorry, tangent, uh, I, I'd like to take a moment and thank our Australian and European listeners. Uh, looking at the uh, statistics, I see that about uh, 10% uh, of viewership is coming from Australia. Thank you very much. And about 9% is coming from Europe. And again, thank you very much. Certainly appreciate uh, you tuning in. So rented space, it could be expensive. It could be cheap. You are going to have an expense there, added overhead. So you're going to have to factor that into, you know, your kind of your, your long-term game plan. 
You could have a location that has a lot of, of traffic. It's easy for people to get to. You have plenty of parking. That could lend itself very well to maybe more of a retail you know, type operation where you're making stuff and selling it right there uh, from the, the workshop. Or you might be in a small industrial area way back in a corner. Nobody knows you're there. The delivery drivers have to stop and ask directions. That could work out well for you too. You might be able to get a space and then sublease that to maybe another craftsman. You know, two birds, one stone. Maybe complementary craftsmen so that you guys could actually, you know, collaborate on, uh, on projects. I could see maybe a blacksmith or metal fabricator and a woodworker. That would be a, an interesting uh, and good combination. So I have six things your workshop must have, and space was number one. Number two is your heating, cooling, and ventilation system, your HVAC. If you are working in a real hot shop, 100 degrees in Arizona in the summer, or maybe even the winter, that's not going to be very comfortable. It's not going to be very productive, and you're probably not going to do it very long. Conversely, if you're in, conversely, if you're in Wisconsin and it's 20 below zero and you have no heat, <laughs> that's not going to, to work either. So evaluate your HVAC system. When I first started out, I did not have a heated garage. And I could get it up to about 40 degrees with using a little kerosene space heater, which threw a ton of fumes and water into the air. And I could only get it up to about 40 degrees. Opening up doors and windows just to keep enough ventilation in there, it was pretty much a losing battle. Forget about doing glue-ups when it's that cold. Finishing is pretty much out of the question. I would bring things into the kitchen to finish them. That didn't work out with young toddlers running all over the place. So the number one priority after that first winter was to insulate and get some heat into the garage. If you are working out of an attached garage and it is heated by the home's HVAC system, make sure you are monitoring your dust creation. You have to be almost fanatical about your dust collection and dust control and change your filters probably twice as often as recommended. Odors can also get pulled into the house. It's kind of that basement shop situation if you are on the same heating and cooling system. If you don't have heat in the detached garage or your attached garage, there are a lot of options for supplementing uh, that heat. I have a hanging gas heater. It just hangs right off the ceiling. A uh, gas line goes up to it. It does a wonderful job. Just the blower kicks on and it just heats up the entire uh, shop area. If you know someone who is maybe replacing an old HVAC furnace that still works, you might be able to pick that up at salvage prices and install it. I've been to auctions where they have been selling, you know, uh, HVAC systems, dirt cheap. That would make a nice supplemental uh, addition to your shop. And I really do like having a separate HVAC system from the rest of the house. Electric forced air systems are very good, very expensive, depending on uh, part of the country or world uh, that you uh, live in. But what about radiant heat? If you have a relatively new construction home, you might have radiant heat sunk in the concrete slab. I've been to shops like that, and they feel just absolutely wonderful. It's not something that is very easy to retrofit. You could use a hot water system, radiant heat, 
by installing baseboards, radiators around the shop. Infrared is another option. These are like large infrared tubes that hang from the ceiling and they heat up the objects in the room, but not the air. All the other systems are a convection system where the air gets heated and that warm air gets circulated. These operate differently and some people like them, some people don't. Check around in your area because typically the best system dominates in certain geographical areas. Another system that I really like that I can't use because I'm in the the uh, city limits is uh, an outdoor furnace. There's a gentleman who has a lumber flooring business not too far from me that I've I've used extensively in my earlier years. Since he is cutting and milling a lot of lumber, he generates a lot of waste and that waste goes into an outdoor furnace. It's basically a big box that you build a fire in, you feed wood into it, close it down, and it burns slowly and quietly throughout the day. The heat generates hot water that is then pumped into a shop and through a system of heat exchangers blows hot, warm air throughout the shop. It works really well, and he pays virtually nothing for it, except for the electricity that operates the water pumps and a little bit of uh, uh, forced air for the, uh, for the burn. They're not horribly expensive, and they last for years and years and years. Not the best option if you're inside the city limits, but if you're out in the country, that could be just a wonderful way of not only heating your shop very economically, but you're also getting rid of a lot of wood waste that you're going to have to deal with one way or the other. What about a wood stove? I mean, that's kind of a nostalgic idea. You know, the wood stove burning quietly on a cold winter's day, maybe a a pot of coffee or, or hot tea bubbling away on top of it. Check with your insurance company first. Some insurance companies totally freak out when you mention wood stove or fireplace. Others just say make sure it's installed according to building code and any governing regulations. Okay, you probably will generate enough wood to keep it uh, fired. Be careful because you do have an open ignition source right here. So hazardous chemicals, uh, spraying lacquer would probably not be a good idea. And of course, you hear of people's shops burning down. And a lot of times it involved a wood stove. So you have to just be very, 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 very careful with that. Uh, Evaluate the, uh, the fire risk before you launch into something like that. Okay, number three, and probably the one that's going to cost the most money and maybe provide you with the biggest headaches. That is electrical. When contractors build houses, they build a garage to house cars. They don't build garages to be later turned into woodworking shops. So it's very likely that your electrical power is going to be inadequate or at the very best um, challenging. Let's put it that way. If you're in an older building, you may only have a 60 amp service, which in today's standards is woefully inadequate. A uh, hundred amp ser- service is considered the the bare minimum in most places. Uh, Two hundred amp services are not out of the question. So in your shop, you may have one duplex outlet on 
each of the three walls. You might have two 100 watt screw in light bulbs in the ceiling. You're going to need to make some upgrades. I would suggest talking to a qualified electrician. Depending on your country or your county and state, you may need a licensed electrician, but make sure that they are qualified and experienced. And just walk through and tell them your dreams. The good one, good ones will be able to give you a lot of really good advice and advice that can save you a lot of money down the road. You're going to need to have a pretty good idea of what you want your shop to look like. What machines are you going to have in? Where will the table saw go? Where will the joiner go? The band saws, the dust collection system. You need to have a fairly good idea and plan ahead on this so that you don't run into stumbling blocks down the road. I would suggest getting some graph paper and make an analog shop planner. Draw the inside dimensions of your shop to scale and then figure out the size of your your table saw and your joiner and your workbenches and cut those out of other graph paper. And you can move this around on the graph paper. I know it's kind of kindergarten-ish. There used to be a really good shop planner on grizzly.com's website, but since the most of the browsers have gone away from supporting Flash. That has gone, gone away, and they haven't built a new new system to replace it yet. So, you know, you have to go analog, and that works perfectly fine. But kind of lay out where things are going to be, and if you can get that nailed down now, that's going to save a lot of time and money further on. Because once you have your electrical figured out, you need to go into number four, lighting. You need to be able to see. And those two 100 watt light bulbs in the ceiling are not going to do it for you. LEDs. That should be the only thing that you're considering now. I have uh, HO80 fluorescent bulbs in my shop that I am slowly replacing with LED 8-foot bulbs. I won't exaggerate by saying the difference is night and day, but yeah, pretty much it is night and day. The LEDs are just so much more bright. They are producing uh, 5,400 degree light, daylight, it's wonderful for finishing. It's not hard on the eyes. It's, they're not flickering, and they're not cheap. But I think they are very well worth it. I will never buy another fluorescent bulb. And this is, again, where your electrician, you know, is your best friend at, at this uh, point. Once you know where your, your workbench is going to be and where your major tools are going to be, then you can start laying out the lights to provide as much light as you need. By the way, as much light as you need, then double it. I don't think you can have too much light in a workshop, especially as we males get older. Guys who are 35, got news for you. You're probably not going to see things in 10 years the way you see them now our eyes just start to decline. doesn't seem to affect women in the same way, but most older woodworkers, they're all wearing, you know, glasses, reading glasses, bifocals, uh, telescopes. Um, in the shop, you just need light to be able to see. And another little freebie I'll throw in here, digital. Digital is really good. I have a, a Wixie digital scale on my table saw and my planer, and I would not trade them. I can see the numbers whenever it's set at 
4.625, that's where the cut gets made. I'm not sitting there trying to, you know, is that line right on it or is it off just a little bit? No, there's no questions. Go digital scales if you have old eyes. It will make your time in a shop so much brighter. I think the last thing that I could suggest as far as electrical and lighting, make everything surface mounts, if at all possible. Instead of running wires through the wall and then fishing them out for receptacles, run them through conduit and surface mount them to the walls. Yeah, it takes up a little bit of wall space, but if you ever need to change something in the future, you'll be happy that you did it this way. It's much easier to change out conduit than it is to fish things behind, you know, finished walls or across the ceiling or things like that. Okay, number five, flooring. You're going to spend a lot of time standing. And speaking from experience, if you're coming from a desk job where you're sitting most of the day and now you're out, you have your dream you're out in your workshop all the time, you're probably standing. And that gets hard on the body. That gets hard on old bodies. So pay attention to your flooring. If you're on concrete, that's tough. It's hard. It's unforgiving. And it gets cold if you live in a cold climate. I remember I, I worked at a retail store that one showroom was in the basement. And in the winter, it got so cold down there. The floor got so cold that I ended up wearing winter boots while I had to work down there because it was the only thing that would keep my feet, you know, halfway warm. Concrete is nice in that it's durable. It's very easy to sweep. Typically, it's not slippery, but it, it could be, depending on how it was finished. Wood, I think, is probably the nicest to work on. There's a little bit of give. If you've noticed, basketball teams play on a wood floor, not a concrete floor. Well, actually, nowadays it's a wood floor over top of concrete, but still, there's that give. There's there's just enough give that makes things not as as hard as as concrete. A strip floor would be probably the best. If you don't already have that now, I don't know if you'd want to install that, but you certainly could. What about a plywood floor? Yeah, that can actually work. I think wood is a little harder to keep clean. It's less easy to, to sweep up, but I would easily trade that for the comfort that it, it uh, would provide. What if you have a concrete floor? Can you put a wood floor over top of it? Yes, absolutely. There's, there's several different ways of, of doing that, uh, depending on your circumstances. The easiest thing really is to put down two before sleepers right on the, the concrete. Make sure that the concrete is, is leveled or at least a consistent um, slope and take up any gaps, any flux areas where, where the, it, it could give excessively. That's going to lead to, to squeaks. But you could do uh, the sleepers and then put 4x8 subflooring on, on top of that and just call it good. Maybe put some type of finish, you know, over the subflooring or, or just tongue and groove plywood. That would be a very viable option. If you're in a cold climate, you can take and throw down some, uh, uh, foam insulation panels between the sleepers and you improve the, uh, the thermal, uh, performance of that floor system. And it's going to be a lot easier on your feet and your knees. Or, if you have a concrete floor, as I do, rubber mats have changed my life. Several years ago, for a Christmas present, 
my children bought me, I think, four rubber mats. They are about four by four, maybe three by three. And we're a little bit on the expensive side. And I wasn't sure how they were going to work out. But my, my son worked at a company that used those in their computer rooms. And he was very impressed with them. I had been using these foam mats that you get at like Costco or Sam's Club. And they worked okay. But still, at the end of the day, yeah, my hips hurt, my knees hurt, my feet hurt. Just kind of general body aches. And that's back when I was a a young man. And ever since I put these rubber mats down, it has been, it's been a game changer. Really, I don't suffer for that pain anymore. Well, I do, but it's from other things. Um, I went out and I bought more mats and, and put them down. The nice thing about them is they're very easy to pull up to sweep around. If you have carts or mobile cabinets that have a four inch caster on them, it glides right over top. I don't think I would try to move my table saw over top of these, but for something relatively lightweight, it works just wonderfully. I think I bought mine at Menards, but I'm sure that you can find these at, at various other places. They have like little little octagon patterns in them. It's not a solid rubber mat, and the little holes in them, I think, really is part of their their superior performance. Okay, last one. Number six, storage. You don't have enough. Period. End of discussion. You need storage. You may think you have enough storage right now. You don't. Plywood, I think, is the hardest thing to store. And I don't use a lot of it, but I finally figured out a way that I can get it into the shop, store it out of the way, get it out and be able to cut it up and use it without Herculean efforts. If you're using plywood a whole bunch, figure out an efficient, effective way of getting it into your shop, cut up, and into a product with as little handling as possible. Lumber. You know, we used to practice a thing called just-in-time inventory control. Yeah, that hasn't worked out all that well now. So I don't mind having some lumber at hand. If somebody comes in and says, I would like you to duplicate this part of a stair in red oak, and I have absolutely no red oak, I don't want to order a great big shipment. So I think you should have not like hundreds and hundreds of board feet, but, you know, have a few boards of various species laying around so that you can satisfy, you know, a, a request like this. Should you store it inside or outside? Um, yes. I have a 8 by 12 yes, it's an 8 by 12 wood shop out back that I store a a lot of wood and a lot of other things that I just don't use on a daily basis. And I have some wood stored in the shop. I have one area that I can stand wood on end uh, vertically, and it works out pretty good. It could be organized better, but, you know, things are a process. If you go out and take a look around your shop, you will find areas that are unused, vacant, voids, and that could store something. And depending what you're doing, how much stuff you have, you can make a little cart, a little cabinet, something to go in there and and fill up that space and get stuff organized. There's a lot of good YouTube videos on shop organization and shop storage. Uh, The only thing I can really say is 4-inch casters are wonderful. I started off 
with the little, you know, one inch, one and a half, two inch casters. Ah, uh, no more. Four inch is the bare minimum. I have a, a couple things on five inch casters. Oh, it's like Christmas every day. They just roll over anything. If you get a small wheel, like an inch and a half wheel, if there's a speck of dust, it gets hung up on that and it just becomes so so infuriating so go with the big wheels on casters a little bit more money but down the road you'll really thank yourself for for doing that and don't forget the ceiling you have a lot of space over your head and you can use that for storage i don't mean like hanging 600 pounds of white oak off your ceiling but you can rig up a little rack and put some, you know, a few two befores, maybe some one buys up there. Use it as a space for storing jigs, just all kinds of things. I store a canoe for my sailing that I'm working on restoring. I lower it down on a hoist system and set it on canoe horses. They're similar to saw horses, but they're made for canoes, and work on the boat, and end of the day, I hoist it back up to the ceiling where it's out of the way. Of course, I'm probably at a little advantage considering that I spent a number of years aboard a nuclear-powered attack submarine, so kind of used to using every square inch of space available, but that's just me. And I know the question that everyone's been asking, do I need a storage shed? Yes, you do. You need a storage shed. Someplace outside, someplace you can put things that you're not using every day, things that you don't really want to keep in the shop, and chances are you already have something uh, like this. So each one of you has a little different circumstance depending on where you live, what product or service you hope to provide. So consider all of these things. I'd recommend a piece of pencil and paper, or in fact, better yet, a spiral-bound graph paper notebook. You can pick these up at Office Depot, you know, office supply stores. The quarter-inch Graph paper squares, super convenient for, for making sketches, for keeping notes, for writing down customers' information. But just start doing a pros and cons on the different systems, the different things you're thinking about. Uh, you can do some cost estimates right off of that. Go ahead and make that sketch of your, your shop to scale and f start figuring, figuring out where things need to go. Try to keep the tools that you're going to use most of the time within one or two steps of your, your main workbench, your main assembly area. And now I would like to introduce a new segment to the show where I make a recommendation of a particular YouTube channel, um, video, maybe a website, the podcast, something that I think you could gain valuable information from, but might not be aware of. And today I'd like to recommend Woodworkers Guild of America. The website is www.goa.com. That's George Vanderiska. I probably butchered that. Sorry, George. Um, has a very good website, very good YouTube channel. Uh, he has a, he calls it a guild. You can either view videos for free or there's different membership levels that you, gives you more access to, to, to more, uh, videos. I've, I've learned quite a bit, uh, watching George's, uh, videos. Um, and I think you might, benefit from it too. He, he has some very good videos uh, talking about storage, how to get the most out of the space that you have. And if you have any questions, comments, complaints, 
corrections, I invite you to email me at roger at working at woodworking.com or you can visit the webpage working at woodworking.com and find out more information and maybe support me on Patreon. So I have a customer who's coming in to pick up a small table that I repaired for him. And until next episode, I am wishing you happy woodworking.